Hi, I'm Bob Balch. Today we're going to be continuing the uh, trial for Michael Lawrence Poussin. I am juror number eight on that case, and today we're going to, uh, uh, I'm going to go over the this day's witness uh, list and, and what they said. And today was actually the end of all of the presentation of the evidence and everything, both the um, the, the prosecution and the defense closed today, and the jury was uh, uh, put in a room and, and told to come up with a decision. I'll be going over exactly what happened in the jury room in another video. So today was an interesting um, uh, turn of events in the, uh, in the case because we had a surprise witness today. Um, and, and just so you'll be up to date, uh, Michael Poussin, he's in his uh, 40s, and uh, he's uh, accused of uh, basically raping a young girl um, continually, repeatedly, uh, over a, a period of time um, that lasted for years, basically. And uh, so he's on trial, um, and uh, the the prosecution has been presenting evidence, but there is no real hardcore um, physical evidence. It's all basically witness testimony for the most part, uh, with the exception of some DNA, which is not a conclusive DNA specimen. And uh, the defense, their, um, their strategy is to uh, have us think that the um, mom of the little girl, of the complainant, is um, has been constantly talking to her for her whole life. Has anyone touched you? Has anyone molested you? And basically the power of suggestion has um, had this little girl uh, come up with this fanciful story, and uh, none of it is true. So um, today's witness um, list, and, and basically I'm, I'm going through this because uh, this is the That's Jesus channel, and uh, I just wanted to share what it's like to be a, a Christian man being uh, uh, on a jury uh, when something as, as heinous a crime uh, as this potentially could be, if it's true, is the subject of the case. And um, uh, of course, when we left this, when I left this morning to, to go to the courthouse, a lot of prayers, been praying a lot about this and uh, just asking for clarity, for discernment, for wisdom. Um, and it's been uh, a, a very difficult case. And, and I've, uh, I've lost some sleep on this, but um, ultimately, I just want the decision to be correct and for, um, the, for justice to be done. God is a, a God of justice, and uh, that's what I want to happen. If, if uh, Mr. Poussin is innocent... Justice will be for him to be go to, to go free, and if Mr. Poussin is guilty, justice would be for him to go to prison. Um, so here we go. The surprise witness, witness number one on Friday, the uh, 12th of May, was the complainant's little cousin. Um, she's 10 years old, about fourth grade, and uh, as she was asked to, to come to the witness stand, there was... Um, a little bit of a gasp by me. Oh, my goodness. I, uh, I was not expecting this. And so she comes to the witness stand, um, and the first, you know, five, ten minutes of questioning, there is no questioning. It's, uh, well, probably five minutes. There is just rapport building between the uh, prosecuting attorney and, um, and the witness. Uh, and, and that's because she is a young girl, and um, she uh, lives with... Uh, She's been uh, uh, adopted by her grandma, and, and that's wonderful. Uh, her nanny lives in Jefferson County, in a, in a city in Jefferson County, and uh, that's her aunt. And she goes to um, the complainant's home on a regular basis in, in this little town in Jefferson County, and she's known the complainant since birth. Uh, she's just a few months older than the complainant, in fact. And uh, she would basically go to spend the night at each other's house. Uh, sometimes the complainant would go to her house, and, and uh, the other times the, the cousin would go to the complainant's house. 
And they spend a lot of time with each other. Uh, they live very close to each other. And the mom, uh, the complainant's mom, would sometimes uh, let her stay the night um, at the, 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 the cousin's house. Uh, she even visited the complainant when the complainant was living in Orange, Texas, with the defendant. And um, basically, the, the, what happened that, that had her be a witness is she spent the night in uh, the small uh, Jefferson County town, uh, during the third grade, or maybe in the summer afterwards, um, you know, she's not 10 yet, so, or, or well, she wasn't um, when this happened. She just turned 10. And um, she arrived on the weekend. It was around noon, uh, about every other week. Sometimes she would uh, spend the night with her cousin, the complainant, and she would stay in the complainant's room, a small house. Um, nobody else was in the room with them. Um, uh, it was a small room, and there was a small divider uh, between um, the complainant and her brother. They uh, it was actually structurally one room, but they had a a divider there. The defendant was also staying that night. Um, the scene unfolds. The cousin is in bed with the complainant. It's uh, dark. It's evening. It's night. Uh, the complainant has already fallen asleep. Apparently, she, fall, she falls asleep early. And this cousin was awake. And then the defendant came into the room. He sat on the bed, and he put his hand. Hey, sorry, we're going to have to stop right there because this testimony, the way I read it note, word for word from my notes, will not be allowed to be played on YouTube. So let me just generically say what happened. Um this young cousin was uh, staying with the complainant in her bed. The complainant was asleep. The defendant came in, and the allegation is that the defendant put his hand inside of her clothes and molested her. Uh, she does not go into her testimony about what the exact body part was. I'm not sure if she just doesn't have that vocabulary or her uh, decorum won't let her say that to a... Um, to an adult, but uh, she does pretty much describe where the defendant allegedly put his hand, and then she graphically describes, uh, and showing us the motion with her hands, says what his fingers were doing while he was molesting her. Um, those are the allegations that she makes. Let's go ahead and get back to me reading the testimony from that day. She clarified that he touched her where she pees. And then when he left, he said, bye. And she tried to get it off of her mind, not think about it anymore. He would, uh, um, sometimes when she stayed there previously, he would come in and talk to uh, her and the defendant. Um, but this was the only time that he ever touched her. She didn't cry. She doesn't remember if she said anything the next morning. Um, she did eventually tell um, the defendant, uh, excuse me, she did tell what the defendant did to her, uh, to, um, her to her cousin, the, the complainant, and she also told her personal sister. Eventually, she told the complainant's mom, the little girl's mom, and in her head, she kept asking herself why she did not tell an adult sooner. Now, there's something interesting about this is that um, she was asked if the man who touched her was in the courtroom, and she said she didn't know. She didn't recognize the person in the courtroom. And um, that's interesting because you know who the defendant is. I mean, he's got his own table there. He's got his own lawyer and um, you can just assume, well, that's the guy right there. But she didn't say that. She was honest. I, I don't know. I, I think that's interesting. Now, why, and, and I'm going through these questions in my mind, why wouldn't she know that that's the defendant? Um, and then I, I think about, some things I, I remember being young and going to my friend's house and meeting their dad or meeting their mom or whatever. 
And looking them in the face was the last thing that I really wanted to do. I wanted to, to play. And um, apparently she she had seen the defendant a few times, a couple times, and um, but, you know, just called him sir, didn't really know what his name was. Uh, she did eventually find out that his name was Mike because she said Mike on the witness stand um, because that's the defendant's name, Michael uh, Lawrence Poussin. But... Um, why wouldn't she recognize him? I just, that kept on going over my head. And then I kept, you know, I thought, well, you know, he's dressed up, uh, in the, in the courthouse. He's got a nice blazer on a nice shirt. Um, he probably didn't look like that. He was a handyman. Um, you know, he's been in jail for probably over a year. I don't, I don't know. They didn't say how long he's been in jail. I'm, I'm assuming, um, that it's been for over a year. So, if he's been in jail for over a year, he hasn't been, you know, he used to be a welder. Maybe he hasn't been outside working and he hasn't had a job. He's just been sitting in the in, a, in the jail cell, maybe secluded because of the charges against him. Uh, maybe he's gained some weight. I mean, he, he looked like a bigger guy um, at the table. So I don't know what he looked like before all this happened. And, and maybe that's why she didn't rec- recognize him. I don't know. I don't know. But... Um, she was certain that it was um, Mr. Poussin, uh, Mike Mike Poussin, and uh, she just didn't recognize him in the in the courtroom. So that was interesting. Uh, then the defense attorney got up and she asked uh, if the defendant touched her thigh, and um, the the little girl, the cousin, uh, said, "No, just my private." Uh, the attorney then asked for the record to be read back to refresh her memory um, because of inconsistent testimony. And then there was a huddle at the judge's desk, and the defense attorney was basically wrong um, <clears throat> because I specifically remember the testimony of of the little girl, of the cousin, and um, she said, were my thigh and private meat. She was trying to narrow it down. I think trying not to say the word P or, you know, whatever slang word um, she knew. And uh, so she said, were my thigh and, you know, private meat, you know, so basically between my legs. And the defense attorney made a big deal out of that, uh, trying to, to say, well, it was on her thigh or something, on the crease of her thigh or something. And so... Um, the little, the little cousin said it was where my thigh and my thing meet. And, uh, the defense attorney then asked if he touched her front and the, the little cousin, she, she looked very confused. And, um, at that point she just didn't understand what the defense attorney was asking. She got confused. She started crying and the court took a short break, and we went outside. Uh, after the break, uh, the questioning continued. Um, the uh, the little cousin's aunt lives in this little city um, in Jefferson County, Texas. Uh, her grandma lived in another city, and uh, very close by. Um, they uh, she did know that the mom had cameras, uh, but she was not sure. Um, if the cameras were there while the defendant was visiting or not. Then she was asked if other men um, had come while uh, she was staying there. And um, uh, she did say that that other men had visited there um, as well. But uh, she knew for certain that uh, it was the defendant that was the one that uh, touched her. Uh, Mike touched her. Um, Then uh, the little cousin, um, when it was, you know, when did the little cousin tell about this incident? And uh, she told about the incident when she was visiting um, her little cousin, the the complainant, the little girl. 
so it was after August of 2021. Uh, and basically, the little cousin asked where the defendant was. She hadn't seen him in a while. And um, she was told that the defendant was locked away for what he did to the complainant. And um, then the little cousin had told um, the complainant what had happened, and she thought that the complainant was going to tell the complainant's mom, but apparently she didn't. And she was thinking, well, you know, maybe he went away because of, you know, what I said. And uh, then come to find out, no, it was because of what the uh, defendant um, had allegedly done to the complainant. And then um, cross-examine everything, you know, um, the uh, or clarifi- clarifying questions. Um, the uh, defendant sat on the bed. Apparently, there was um, uh, that they wanted to be specific on that. He sat on the bed. The bed was small. There was not room for three people to be in the bed, but two small girls was okay on the bed. And so that was the testimony of the complainant's little cousin, who's only a couple months um, older than she is. Um, then we had. Um, Another witness, and this was the, uh, he'd been a witness before um, on a previous day, and um, he's the, the uh, uh, one of the investigators or detectives specializes in, in sex crimes and stuff uh, for this little town in uh, Jefferson County, and he said that there was a case for uh, the, defend- the, uh, the complainant's cousin as well, and uh, it was... Um, indecency with a child with sexual contact um, and that basically the um, the cousin's uh, aunt or grandma, I'm not sure which, had reported it. Uh, the touching was attempting to sexually arouse anyone, including the victim. And there was uh, some confusion about exactly um, where the touching happened. Was it the crease of the thigh or the vagina? And um, the, the question was asked, well, what if it was the crease of the thigh and, and not the vagina? And the, uh, the detective basically said, well, it's up to a grand jury as to whether or not charges should be brought. If it's not the vagina, uh, even if it is just the crease of the thigh, it may not be sexual contact, contact but it's another crime. And so... Um, he said that it's normal for offenders to test the waters by touching body parts and then working their way up from there if there's no complaint. So a little bit of discrepancy in, in, in that testimony. Was it on the thigh or was it on the private parts? Regardless, um, if, if her testimony is, is true, um, even if it was on the thigh, uh, a grown man has no business putting his hand there. So the question is, do you believe whether it's true or not? And so we'll be talking about that when we deliberate. Uh, Then the defense lawyer got up and talked to this uh, investigator, too, um, asked, did the mom contact you? No. Uh, Did you know that the mom was the first adult to be told? Um, And he said, it looks like in the report that it came from the uh, the little cousin's um, aunt or grandma, and uh, during the result, the, here's the next question. During the assault, it was reported that um, the defendant was lying uh, down instead of sitting uh, in the, 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 so this little cousin also went to that facility in the, in the county where they interview um, potential sex victims. And, um, and, and that interview was unsure if, um, the, the the little cousin was unsure whether or not um, she was on the floor while this happened or her um, or the complainant was on the floor um, but it was said that the defendant laid down beside her so um, that that was interesting a little bit of inconsistency in that testimony but um, regardless of that you know how you move your fingers and 
and all those things, um, and her saying this before um, she knew about the other allegations uh, against the defendant are very interesting. Um, and then the redirect from the prosecuting attorney was, "Did uh, to, this is to the detective still, um, is all of this uh, in Jefferson County? And he said yes. And then the prosecution rested. They were, they were done with their case. Uh, the defense finally gets to present their witnesses, right? And so they did call a witness. He didn't, uh, wasn't ready. Um, I don't know if he wasn't really ready or wasn't there. But then they called the defendant to the stand, um, which was a surprise. I, I didn't think the defendant would get on the stand, but he did. Um, it's certainly his right to uh, stay silent if he wants to or get on the stand and, and, um, and plead his case. So he got on the stand. And of course, these are the defense witnesses. So the defense gets to ask the first set of questions and then the prosecution comes back and then the defense and the prosecution again. So the, uh, you had some clarifying questions um, that uh, uh, the defendant uh, had to go through Mike, uh, Michael Lawrence Poussin. Um, so how did you meet um, the, the, uh, the mom, the, the little girl's mom? Um, and he said that his ex-wife uh, in 2002, 2003 had uh, uh, been dating a cousin of, um, had a cousin that was dating the, the, the mom and he divorced in 2017, and his he said what his kids' ages were uh, when he got divorced, and and when he and how old they are now. Uh, basically, has three boys and a girl, um, and that the the mom of the complainant she got divorced in 2017. Uh, the defendant was awarded custody and the home when he got divorced. Apparently, his wife just left, just kind of vanished for a while. And uh, they started dating. They they both basically got divorced in 2017, and they both um, the the dating relationship started in about March of 2018. And um, he explained that uh, the mom of the complainant had two kids. Well, actually, three kids, but two living with her um, little the little girl and uh, her older brother, who was about I don't know. Eight, seven, eight, nine years older. I, I'm. I, I, I guess I should take better notes than that. I'm sorry. I apologize. Uh, the uh, the mom moved in about five or six months after they had been dating in about August of 2018, and the kids and the defendant and the mom, they all got along great. Just got along great. Uh, went eating out to eat. Went to the park. School functions. Um, he worked for um, uh, a local company as a welder, and um, the uh, the mom uh, worked um, in the uh, Jefferson County area cleaning houses. The mom was going to school um, also, and the complainant was in daycare, and all the other kids were in school. And then the, the question was asked, well, you know, Tell us about the bedrooms. And so it was about a 2,200-square-foot house, uh, two-story, four bedrooms. Um, the uh, defendant and the mom were uh, sharing the, the master bedroom. Um, the complainant, the little girl, and her older brother had a room. And then uh, two, the two, two of the defendant's boys had a room. And then um, the other boy, the older boy, um, he had a room of his own. Uh, I believe he was 16 or 17 at the time. And um, the daughter moved back to, to her mom's house. The defendant's daughter moved out soon after um, the uh, complainant, the little girl, and her mom had moved in with uh, the little girl's older brother. And so in uh, about, no, that was August, I guess, um, and I'll give the, the the 
the defendant's daughter maybe a month or two to, to move out. Here we come around to November of 2018. And the mom called and said that the defendant's son had touched her daughter, the complainant, the little girl. Uh, the police came after the mom called, and uh, they came. The, the call didn't come until after the defendant got home. The defendant said to call the police, and uh, the defendant's son went in for questioning, and everyone came to the uh, SANE exam. That's the sexual assault nursing exam. I believe that's what it was. Um, except for the defendant's son. He wasn't there. He was with the police. Uh, and then after the, uh, basically the rape kit was done, the, um, everyone goes to this, we've heard this testimony before. Everyone goes to the, um, the facility in, in Jefferson County where they, uh, do these extended interviews with, uh, sexual abuse victims. There's, you know, cameras in the room, uh, and, Police and investigators can watch from another room, but the parents can never get the results. And um, so everyone was there for that interview as well, except for the defendant's son, who was allegedly had uh, molested the, um, the the little girl, the complainant. And then um, the defendant's son moved out. He moved in with the defendant's dad. And um, and then at the second interview, there was a second interview um, within 30 days um, where they interviewed the little girl, the complainant, again at that facility. And um, the defendant was not there for the second interview. He was not there for that one. Uh, CPS came by twice. Um, the defendant was only there once when they came by. They talked to the defendant and the mom together. He does not recall if uh, the defendant and the, uh, the does not recall if, if he and the mom ever discussed uh, his son moving back in. The mom and the little girl and and of course her brother uh, moved out in 2019 after a breakup. He, he first said it was early 2019, and then he said it was the summer of 2019. Um, so, and then they talked about his uh, work schedule um, or, or his employment history. Uh, he changed uh, to be a welder at another company, and then he changed again um, before. Uh, he moved out of his home in Orange County. Um, he changed to uh, to be a welder for a third company. Uh, this is the third company, and uh, that job happened to be in Freeport, Texas. And um, so the next question was, would you go hunting? And he said that he went nuisance hunting. Uh, basically... They wouldn't actually go out hunting. It was, uh, you just had a bunch of nuisance rodents in the areas like squirrels and raccoons, stuff like that, that knock over the trash and steal things outside the house that you don't want stolen and things like that. And uh, But he would not go past the property line. He would just shoot them out of the trees. But then he said that his property was cleared. And so if it's cleared, it doesn't have any trees. So that was interesting. Um then he said that, uh, yeah, that he and the uh, little girl, the, the complainant, would sometimes go uh, do this nuisance hunting together. Um, he denies the lawn chair incident where the, uh, the little girl um, graphically described being um, raped in the lawn chair. He denied all the incidents, in fact. He denied hurting any child. Uh, he said that he had a daddy-daughter relationship with the little complainant, that he bought all of the kids' toys. Um, he didn't just buy her toys. But he bought all the kids' toys. He spoiled all the kids. He worked, um, according to the defendant, he worked uh, six days a week, 10 hours a day. Um, and he was, on the day that he was off, he usually spent that out in his shop. He did not take vacation. He worked from 6.30 in the morning till 5 in the evening. And um, the mom cooked dinner. 
The mom never cleaned houses at night, so basically he was never there by himself with the little girl. Um, He said that the mom was always home by the time he got home, and she only cleaned one house, and that was during the day um, while everybody was at school, basically, and that he uh, worked for about a year in Freeport until November of 2020. Um, He had an old GMC truck. The back seat was always full of tools. It was a very cluttered truck. He said he would uh, get off on at, at 5 p.m. on Saturday and then drive three and a half hours to get home. So he wouldn't get home until about 8.30 Saturday night. And then um, he would stay around the house and barbecue and stuff. And then he would leave about 2.30 Monday morning to go back to work. And so... That was interesting because three and a half hours, if you're doing 60 miles an hour, um, that's a hundred, that's, that's over 200 miles and maybe three and a half hours round trip would be the right way to do that math. But he said it was three and a half hours one way. So that was interesting. I noted that. Um, He said that uh, while he was gone in Freeport that his sister would watch his kids and he would pay his sister. Um, uh, He said that he broke up with the um, complainant's mom when she moved out. They got back together after a month or two. And um, when they got back together, he just moved his clothes. He didn't move any furniture. Uh, He had gotten rid of everything. Uh, he denies taking the little uh, little girl, the little complainant, to the empty house in Orange. She had made that allegation that um, he had taken her to that house in Orange County, Texas, and it was completely vacant of any furniture, um, you know, echoing in the halls and, the, and and in all the rooms and everything, and that he had um, uh, raped her in the bathroom there. Um, but he denies that, ever taking the little girl to the house. Uh, he said the house was auctioned off. Uh, apparently, he had gone bankrupt. So my question to myself is, he's saying that, was how in the world does does this little girl know that the house was empty if you didn't take her? Um, that's what's going through my mind as he's saying that. Um, then he... Uh, um, After that job in Freeport was over, uh, he started a handyman business in uh, this little town in Jefferson County. And uh, sometimes um, the little complainant's mom would uh, be used to to clean houses that he worked on. After the defendant moved to that little town in Jefferson uh, County, uh, things really got rocky. Now, remember... Um, it was already rocky. He had, you know, the, the mom had already moved out. Uh, but then things really got rocky, according to the, the defendant. Um, mom would create fake Facebook accounts and, and try to contact him on fake phone numbers and things like that to try to catch him cheating. And um, she was always accusing him of cheating. The mom was always accusing the defendant of cheating. Uh, and in Orange, the mom had punched the defendant in the face, and he had to call the police, and they broke up. And um, it was after the mom punched the defendant in the face that she moved out and moved back to her little hometown in Jefferson County. Um, the uh, the grandma, the the little girl, the complainant's grandma, did not like the defendant, but he had no problem with her. Um, The uh, mom had several male friends. Uh, One of them was mentioned by name in the trial. Um, He was hired to help her work on houses in uh, the summer of 2021, a few months before their final breakup. And then he had no idea who the two other people were in orange, There was a camera system installed after um, the mom moved in with uh, the little complainant and her brother. The cameras were in the living room, the master bedroom, and the kitchen. 
and um, she could look at live uh, camera camera feeds or recordings on that camera system. Um, the uh, Jefferson County uh, um, home, the small from that small town in Jefferson County, it also had cameras um, because of the kids' mischief, and they would be caught. But that house is only about 800 square feet, and when the defendant moved in, um, the complainant and her older brother shared one of the only two bedrooms. Now, the, um, the, the little cousin had mentioned that that bedroom was partitioned off um, so that um, I don't know if partitioned means a, uh, a piece of plywood or a regular two by four, um, you know, wall was put up. I, I don't know. But um, anyway, the, the, the little cousin had mentioned that it was partitioned. He didn't mention anything about that. Um, uh, he said that they did not turn off the camera system um, or move the cameras. He said that uh, the mom could pull up the videos on her phone. And after he moved in, in November 2020, he moved out three or four times. And uh, he only had clothes to take. He didn't have any furniture to take. Even after he moved out, the mom was in contact with him, and um, she would try to convince him to move back in for some reason. She always accused him of cheating. Uh, she punched him in this little small town in Jefferson County. Remember, she had already punched him in Orange County. She threw things at him, and he never did anything to her. He never responded. And uh, he said that sometimes they would go gambling together. In August or July of um, 2021 or 2020, I guess, uh, he left for good. Uh, this would be 2021, I think. He left for good. Um, she blocked the door so he couldn't leave. And then as he was leaving anyway, she pushed him and he broke his finger. Um. He went and stayed with a friend, and then um, he said that the um, the mom would come to his job. In fact, she came three times to his job and screamed at him because he wouldn't answer his phone. Um, the defendant tried to find another place to live, um, and the mom called, but the defendant would not pick up, and the mom kept on getting more and more angry. Um, he wrecked his truck because someone ran a red light, and um, this was about two weeks after he left, and the defendant asked if a friend could pick him up uh, from a town in Louisiana called Lake Charles. I guess that's where he wrecked his truck, and the friend sent another friend instead to pick him up. The, uh, the mom texted him with accusations all the time, and the defendant said that she was crazy. And any time the little complainant came back from somewhere, uh, the mom always would ask if anyone touched her, and the complainant said no. And then the mom would ask again to, just to confirm. And at some point, the defendant learned that the mom had been abused. Now, she didn't say that she'd been abused, but he said that she told him that. Um, after the allegation of in 2021... Um, the, uh, defendant said that mom threatened him before that allegation and that the defendant did not believe that the mom had actually called the police in 2021 and the mom contacted again, but the defendant just ignored her. And at some point they got back together to have sex, but they did not talk about the, what she had alleged him doing to her daughter. And on October 22nd, 2021, he went to Las Vegas because he'd got a free trip from a, um, um, a casino. Um, and uh, he had that free trip for quite a while. He just hadn't used it, but he finally used it. He was there for over 30 days in Las Vegas. Um, I'm assuming that that free trip didn't last for 30 days, so I'm not sure um, what he was doing there for 30 days. But I do know that he said that he got arrested on December 10th, 
He got there, remember, October 22nd, 2021. He got arrested on December 10th. They didn't say what he was arrested for. And uh, during that time, from October 22nd to December 10th, um, the mom was asking asking him to come home and um, in, in phone conversations and texts. And um, on his phone, he, he had her little nickname, a soulmate in love. And he loved her, but he just couldn't deal with her craziness anymore. And then the defense attorney just asked him point blank a bunch of questions. And the defendant denied ever sexually abusing the little girl, the complainant, he denied having sex with the complainant. He denied doing anything inappropriate with the complainant. His last words on the stand before he got down, or before he was um, uh, got finished with the defense attorney, was, I don't think I did anything with her, and I don't think anybody else did anything with her either. So he's basically saying everything that she said in her testimony Hundred percent a lie, definitely nothing true. So the prosecutor gets up to cross-examine um, Mr. Pusson, and um, the defendant uh, agrees on his name, on his age. So he is over seventeen. Uh, that he lived in Orange County. That he lived in Jefferson County. That um, he was a stepdad figure. That he was the only uh, person that had that role of a, of a, of a dad figure. Uh, he acknowledged that he had a storage unit, that he took the complainant to the storage unit on one or two occasions. He uh, agreed that he took the complainant to the, um, that interview at that special facility uh, in 2018. Um the implication being there, I'm, I'm guessing why the prosecutor wanted that said is because if he was there, she might have felt nervous and not said anything in 2018. Um, he agreed that his son had moved out. He agreed that CPS came twice with no issues. He agreed that his job uh, had a lot of hours. He agreed that he worked in Freeport um, while... Um, the while the mom and the complainant lived in Jefferson County, he agreed that he had a truck full of tools in the back. He agreed that he had a shifter behind the steering wheel. He agreed that he had a truck with two bucket seats. He agreed that there was a camera system that was hardwired and that he did have access to the camera system on his phone. He agreed that he moved out several times, but would get back together with the mom. He said that nobody had... And, and he said that nobody had molested the little girl. Nobody had molested the complainant. And he said it was all made up, and the jury can either believe him or believe the little girl. He doesn't gain anything. Uh, oh, what he gains if, is if, uh, if, if the jury believes him, he gains not going to prison. But what does... The little girl gain. This was the the question with, that the prosecutors were asking, and he said he she has no motive unless someone said something. And um, what does the little cousin have to gain? He said there's you know no motive unless somebody said something to him. And then what does the mom have to gain? And he said she should be ashamed of what she's told the little complaint. And then um, he said, it was asked, the, the prosecuting attorney asked, should the little cousin, cousin have been able to identify you? And he said, yeah, she should have been able to identify me. So that tells me that um, that corroborates that he had been in the house with the little cousin and that she had seen him before and because he had seen her before. So um, that was that was interesting that uh, he said, yeah, she should have been able to recognize me, uh, but she didn't. And so um, then there's a, the recross from the defense attorneys get up and they say, um, did 
the little cousin come to visit? And he said a few times. Did that little cousin spend the night when the mom's son was there? The little complainant's older brother. Was she there when the older brother was there? And uh, he said, yeah. And um, he said, uh, did the little girl, did the complainant have access to electronics? He said she had a, a tablet and a PlayStation. Both of them had um, access to the interview to the internet, uh, but he put a block on the tablet, uh, but he didn't put a block on the PlayStation. He didn't think everyone had access to the PlayStation, and the little girl's, uh, the little complainant's brother, older brother, had access to the PlayStation. He played it all the time. He said he never gave a phone to the um, complainant. He said he never touched the little cousin, and said he would. Talk to the girls in that room sometimes, though. And then there was another redirect for the prosecuting attorney. She came, uh, she asked or clarified the mom moved out of Orange before 2020. And um, for quite a while after, she, she stayed there quite a while after the son, the, the defendant's son, had moved out. And then she clarified that uh, the mom. And the uh, little girl, the mom and the complainant, did visit Orange, the, the, the home in Orange County, after they had moved out. So they moved out, moved to Jefferson County, and then went back to Orange to visit sometimes. Um, and the question was asked, did the defendant move in with the mom before his house in Orange County was sold? And he wouldn't really give a straight answer. He, he said it was in the process of an auction and that he had filed for bankruptcy and um, that he didn't go back and visit because someone moved in. And then, well, how do you know someone moved in? You know, I don't know. Um, he was asked why um, the, the, the prosecuting attorney, um, while this was happening, um, the defense attorney had given her a big old stack of papers, you know, like a, a ream of paper, about that big, maybe 500 pages, I guess. Um, and she just kind of flipped through it a little bit. And it was very dramatic. Um, I think the defense attorney wanted everyone to see this big stack of papers. And the prosecuting attorney said, why didn't she get everything in the phone dump? And um, the... Defendant was like, I didn't give you anything in the phone dump. You know, my, that was my lawyer. I didn't give anything. He's been in jail, right? So that was interesting. And then the defense um, uh, re talked to the, the to the to the defendant again and said, Was it Rockport or Freeport? Because Rockport's a little bit further away, I, I believe. And he said, No, it was Freeport. And so um, there was because there. She tried to clarify that because of the previous questioning about why it was a three and a half hour drive. And um, the defendant said he had another phone when he was arrested in Las Vegas. And apparently he had another phone before that one was dumped. So I, I don't know what it is about the phones. Um, you'll find out when we, when in just a minute. So then we went to lunch. And uh, came back from lunch, and, and you're, you might be thinking, well, why don't you do another video? That's, that's you know, four hours of testimony. Well, because the testimony is almost done. So we came back from lunch, and um, there was another defense witness. And this guy um, was from Klein Investigations, he said. Um and he said he was a, a senior investigator. Um, he had been licensed for 12 years to do private investigating, private investigations, been doing it full time for nine years. And he did a phone sweep. Um, and they, what, what kind of phone sweeps can you do? Remember, this is the uh, defense attorney asking him questions. He said, you can mirror the phone. You can do a data dump. You can do a full extraction, including getting those deleted files off of the phone. Um, well, what programs did you use? We used uh, two programs. One was not successful. One was successful. 
And then um, the defense attorney showed him the um, the defendant's phone, um, said that it, she initially gave him the phone on March 9th. Uh, the failed extraction happened on March 14th. And then the successful extraction happened on March 22nd. Now, this is May, so March, April, May. So um, he wasn't hired too long ago. So, um, and then she tries to, you know, make everybody feel comfortable about his expertise doing all this phone stuff. And so um, what kind of training do you have? And, And he said, well, he got training on the programs to do the phone extractions and they watched YouTube videos on on how to use those programs. And uh, so she said, well, what kind of investigative training have you had? And he said, well, um, I'm a Texas licensed investigator. I have tons of classes on security investigations and phone dumps. And the uh, and apparently, you know, th- th- she stopped asking him, you know, all kinds of uh, the, the more... Um, how much of an expert he was. And she went right into, okay, what kind of phone is it? It's a Motorola. And, uh, and then the prosecution objected and said, he's not a qualified expert. And boom, we were gone. And we came back from this little break and the witness was, was gone. And so I guess they decided, um, he wasn't an expert and, um, the, you know, all of the stuff he was going to talk about the phones, um, we're not going to hear anything about that. And then that was it. The defense rested. And uh, the the charges were read, very long list of charges. Um, and uh, we have our closing arguments. And that's what I'll get into in my next video. Uh, we'll talk about the closing arguments, the charges that were read, and um, the, uh, the, the initial jury deliberation. So I appreciate you tuning in. Um, watch the next video. I'll we'll be talking about the, uh, the, the, the jury discussion. It's, it's a lot of pressure. It's a lot of pressure because if the, if the defendant is guilty, um, he needs to go to prison. You know, he, he needs to go to prison for a long time if he's guilty. And if he's, innocent bless his heart that's awful to be accused of something so horrendous and it be totally all lies so um it's a big responsibility because you have this little girl she if 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 she is a liar you know shame on her and whoever convinced her to lie or whoever brainwashed her to lie shame on them but if she's telling the truth Oh my goodness, it's just horrible the things that have been done to her. So it is a lot of responsibility. Um, But uh, I I appreciate you watching this all the way to the end. My name is Bob Balch with the That's Jesus channel. Have a great day and be blessed.